Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Genesis. All about beginnings and all those things that happened so long ago. In case you weren't aware, um, by almost any standard that you can think of, the book of Genesis covers more than half of the history of our world, from the time of creation down to the time of uh, the death of Joseph. It, and that would be around about uh, 1500 BC. Uh, we're talking about more than half of the history of our world. So God chose to pick these stories that we're studying as being the most important ones to include in his history of the first half of the world. And this particular lesson, lesson number seven from May 14, is the covenant with Abraham. So we're going to be lawyers this week. We're going to talk about a lot of promises and how you set agreements and, and make covenants and so forth. We'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our Father, we have come to try to understand things that happened so long ago in an environment that is very different than the environment, the environment in which we live today. Help us to understand them, to understand what Abraham went through, all the challenges he had, and so forth, as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson will focus on covenants or binding legal agreements between God and Abraham. Now, someone's going to ask me, why do binding legal agreements really matter? in the process of salvation. And I will tell you that there are some people who believe that salvation is all about binding legal agreements. But uh, I happen not to think that that's the case. Let's see what we can learn from this lesson. Jim, can you tell us about uh, Genesis 17, 7 there? I will keep my promise to you and, in your de and to your descendants in, in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants, Abraham. American Bible Society, 1992. Good News Translation. And that's, yeah, the one that's commonly called the Good News Bible. Notice that this covenant is to be at least a part of an everlasting covenant. That's really important. Why do we, why do we want to emphasize the everlasting part? Well, God doesn't change, so if he okay. makes, a, makes a commitment, you yeah. can depend on it. Well, not only that, but... An everlasting covenant would involve all of what we call the great controversy. From the beginning in heaven, the time when Lucifer rebelled and so forth, all the way down to the time of the destruction of all evil at what we call the third coming of Christ, a thousand years after his second coming. So this everlasting covenant must involve significant amount of people through that entire period of time. So that's what we're going we're gonna to try to think in those terms as we study together. Ever, everlasting or eternal covenants are mentioned in several places in the New Testament. Notice the following in Hebrews 13. Carrie? I'm uh, re reading verses 20 and 21. God has raised from the death our Lord Jesus, who is the eternal covenant, is sealed. Oh, he's the great uh, shepherd. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Does Can I, I make this a little bit larger? Yeah, I get a lot of glare. That's better. Okay. God has raised from death our Lord Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the sheep as the result of his blood, by which the eternal covenant is sealed. There's that internal covenant again. <clears throat> May the God of peace provide you with every good thing you need in order to do his will and may he through Jesus Christ do in us what pleases him and to Christ be the glory forever and ever amen that's from the good news bible so forever and ever that's another term for everlasting isn't it yeah okay Duane you want to tell us what comes next there this episode of Abraham's life is full of emotion fear and laughter Abram is afraid Genesis 15:1, as are Sarah, Genesis 18:15, and Hagar, Genesis 12. I'm sorry, Genesis 12:21:17. Abram laughs, 
Genesis 17:17, 17, 17. and Sarah. And Sarah, Genesis 18:12, and Ishmael too, Genesis 21:9. These chapters resonate with human sensitivity and warmth. Abram is passionate about the salvation of the wicked Sodomites. He is caring toward Sarah, Hagar, and Lot, and he is hospitable toward the three foreigners. From our Bible study guide that we study together. In this lesson, we will see that Abraham was afraid, Sarah was afraid, Hagar was afraid. Of what were they afraid? Abraham was afraid that enemies might attack him. Remember, we talked about last time the fact that he had gone and conquered a bunch of kings, hadn't he? And wondering if, what are the chances that he's going to be uh, get retribution. He was also afraid that he would not have a son who could carry on his promised rewards. God had promised him quite a lot. And so now we come to Genesis 15 and 18, 21. Myra? Yeah, some of the verses that uh, Dwayne referenced. Genesis 15, 1. After this, Abraham had a vision and heard the Lord say to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I will shield you from danger and give you great reward. Now let me interrupt for a second. How would you feel if God himself told you that? Well, you know, it's a lot of people who are afraid of God. Mm -hmm. And here God is saying, do not be afraid. Yeah. Good point. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. Okay. Genesis 18, 15. Because Sarah was afraid, she denied it. I didn't laugh, she said. Yes, you did, he replied. You laughed. Good news. <laughs> I have to laugh every time I think about yeah. that story. Okay. Genesis 21, 17. God heard the boy crying, and from heaven the angel of God spoke to Hagar. What are you troubled about, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying. It is not only fear that we notice in this lesson connected with this covenant. There was also laughter. So what makes these famous biblical characters laugh? Genesis 17, 17. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground, but he began to laugh when he thought, can a man have a child when he is 100 years old? Can Sarah have a child at 90? Okay, I'm going to interrupt here again. Okay, Abraham departed from his first home. We don't even know at what age. He he, God said, I want you to go, and I'm going to give you a big chunk of land somewhere that you've never been. You don't even know what kind of place I'm sending you. And your descendants are going to inherit that property. He, st he stays in Haran for a while. His father dies. And God says, okay, now, Abraham, it's time to move on. He's 75 years old. 25 more years have gone by. And three people come walking down on an, an afternoon in the heat in the desert, come walking along, and Abraham sees them out. Oh, come on in. Tell me what's going on. What's, what's the news, et cetera, et cetera. And before they finish their conversation, one of them says to Abraham, I'll be back in about nine months and your wife's going to have a baby. And Abraham says, excuse, excuse, me, excuse me, what did you say? <laughs> you know, just try to, try to imagine that his story. <laughs> You're spilling the beans of the, what I'm going to read next. Okay, go ahead, read. Genesis 18, 9 to 15. Then they asked him, where is your wife, Sarah? She is there in the tent, he answered. One of them said... Okay, now let me interrupt again in case some of our readers don't understand. Why is she in the tent, hiding, more or less? Because women aren't supposed to see men that aren't their relatives. And they're not supposed to be eating with them. Yeah, their husband's fine, but not with other men at the same time, yes. This is a different kind of a society. So one of them, that is one of the three visitors, said... Nine months from now, I will come back and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. <laughs> Sarah was behind him at the door of the tent listening. Abraham and Sarah were very old. That is, Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. And Sarah uh -huh. had stopped having her monthly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said... To herself, notice. Yes. Now that I am old and worn out, can I still enjoy sex? And besides, my husband is old too. But of course, we know that Abraham had a bunch of kids after this. Right. With another woman. 
Then the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I'm so old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I'm going to interrupt again. You see that it says that the Lord there is in cap, capital letters. What does that mean? Small caps, that's Yahweh. Yahweh, okay, that's Yahweh. Had Abraham and Sarah figured out at this point that they were talking to God? Or was this still not, were they still not too sure? I don't I mean, know, but even if they knew they were talking to God, you yeah. can't help but think I wouldn't, be snickering or kind of going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're going to have a, have a baby? Ah, uh, yeah. You, you're not even 90. Not even close. <laughs> okay. So, so he says, is there anything too hard for Yahweh? As I said, nine months from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Because Sarah was afraid, she denied it. I didn't laugh, she said. Yes, you did, he replied. You laughed. And that he replied, that's Yahweh. That's God. Yeah, exactly. So did they have a, a sort of a hint at that point in time who they were talking to? <laughs> I think they hadn't put it all together. How do we explain the fact that two people who laughed at God, including the one who lied about it, both ended up being examples, in fact, major examples of great faith as listed in Hebrews 11. Are we missing something? But it was not only Abraham and Sarah who showed emotion. There was also another occasion which was probably much more serious. Genesis 21, 9, and it depends on your translation how you read uh, this verse. One day Ishmael, now we haven't talked We've just touched on the, the, the story of Ishmael. Ishmael was about how many years older than Isaac? Do we know? Somewhere around 20 is what I... That's a little bit more. Probably 13, 14 or something like that. Years older than Isaac. So one day Ishmael, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham, was playing with Era's son, Isaac. Some translations suggest that he was mocking him and Sarah, look at the King James. Sarah said, saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking, but not or laughing or playing with her son Isaac. So, how do you understand the cutting of animals that Abraham was requested to do? So now we're going to go to another more detailed covenant. Jim? Genesis 15, verses 1 to 21. After this, Abraham had a vision and heard the Lord say to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I will shield you from danger and give you a great reward. But Abram answered, Sovereign Lord, what good will your reward do me, since I have no children? My only heir is Eliezer of Damascus. You have given me no children, and one of my slaves will inherit my property. When he heard the Lord speaking to him again, his slave Eliezer will not inherit your property. Your own son will be your heir. The Lord took him outside and said, Look at the sky and try to count the stars. You will have as many descendants as that. Abraham put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and has accepted him. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. What was Abraham's basis for trusting God at this point? Oh, he'd had a number of years of travel. And he said, leave Ur. He left Ur. Later he said, leave Haran. He left Haran. He traveled down to this area. <coughs> God guided I mean, you know, God is guiding him and directing him and more or less continuously. Huge numbers of animals, yeah. flocks, and mm -hmm. servants, and workers, and... Okay, so apparently he was somewhat familiar with the voice of the Lord, so he was pretty sure who was talking to him. Okay? Then the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who led you out of Ur in, Babylon, in Babylonia and gave you, to give you this land as your own. But Abram's uh, I'm going to interrupt for a second again. I, I'm gonna, I need to stop doing this, but Babylonia there, that's not what the text says. What the text says is Cal... Um, 
Chaldea. Chaldea. Chaldeans. And that's confusing to people because the Chaldeans moved from northern Mesopotamia, the northern part of where of 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 the Euphrates and, and Tigris rivers, all the way down clear to the southern part, and then they eventually conquered the people in between and moved back and became the future kings in Babylon. So now, when they say ba Ur in Babylonia, Ur was not really in Babylonia. Ur, this was Ur of the Chaldees way before they were in Babylonia. So it's a little confusing here. Go ahead. But Abram asked, Sovereign Lord, how can we know that it is that it will be mine? He answered, Bring me a cow, a goat, and a ram, each of them three years old, and a dove and a pigeon. Abram brought the animals to God, cut them in half, and placed the halves opposite each other in two rows. But he did not cut up the birds. Vultures came down on the bodies, but Abram drove them off. When the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and fear and terror came over him. So Abraham is afraid again. The Lord said to him, Your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. They will be slaves there and will be treated cruelly for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and when they leave that foreign land, they will take great wealth with them. But you yourself will give excuse me, will live to a ripe old age, die in peace, and be buried. It will be four generations before the descendants come back there, because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked that they must be punished. When the sun had set and it was dark, a, smoked, a smoking pot fire and a flaming torch suddenly appeared and passed between the pieces of the animals. Then there's, excuse me, <laughs> then and there the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He said, I promise to give you, give your descendants all this land from the border of Egypt to the river Euphrates, including the land of the Kenites, the Ken Kenizzites, the Kedmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. Good news Bible. Wow. So do you think Abraham started traveling around the country and said, guess what, folks? Your land's going to be my land one of these days. I mean, how many people did he tell this to? Hopefully not those people. <laughs> to our modern eyes, there was a very, this, that was a very strange event. However, the cutting in half of animals and laying them out on the ground and passing between the cut portions was a method of covenant signing, recognized in the part of the world from which Abraham had come as a way to seal an agreement or covenant. As a result, Abraham trusted God. God counted it as righteousness on Abraham's part. So who was the one who instructed him to do all this funny stuff? God. God told him to do it, didn't he? So why did God tell him to do it? That was the way that, I mean, we would call a lawyer and get some legal paper signed. Well, this is the way you call a lawyer in his day. That's, that's, did God recognize that that was what was meaningful to Abraham and the people like him? And so he said, this is the way we'll do it. That was what Abraham was used to, is mm -hmm. to make an agreement, mm -hmm. a binding agreement. And in some places, if you go to the, um, the archaeological museum in Istanbul, Turkey, you will see what is thought to be the oldest known covenant between two groups of people. And in those days, if you cut the animals in half and you lay them out, and then you violate that agreement, then that's what's supposed to happen to you. That what? Cutting? Cutting, cutting, half. cutting you in half. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to die. Well, go, oh, I'm sorry, Carrie, you want to take that next one as soon as I get to it? Yeah. To our modern eyes, oh, no, this is this notion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This notion is extraordinary, especially in that culture. In the religion of the ancient Egyptians, for instance, judgment was made on the basis of counting one's human works of righteousness against the righteousness of the goddess Mayat 
who represented divine righteousness. In short, you had to earn salvation. Okay. That came from that old Sabbath school Bible study guide. And I'm not quite sure why they're comparing him to the Egyptians at that point in time, because he didn't come from there and he didn't spend very much time down there. But what interesting, maybe even obscure meanings were conveyed by this ceremony? Dwayne? God then sets up a sacrificial ceremony for Abram to perform. Basically, the sacrifice points to Christ's death for our sins. Humans are saved by grace, the gift of God's righteousness symbolized by these sacrifices. But this particular ceremony conveys specific messages for Abram. The praying of the vultures on the sacrificial animals in Genesis 15, 9-11 means that Abraham's des descendants will suffer slavery for a period of 400 years. Genesis 15, 13, or four generations, spoken in Genesis 15, 16. Then in the fourth generation, Abram's descendants shall return here, said in Genesis 15, 16, uh, New King James Version. Okay. So that's, of course, from our adult Bible study guide. Um, so now I wonder as I read through these things, how much detail you can read into this ancient language. Um, you see what they have done here, and it's nice to think, okay, there's a parallel between this and that thing, something happened a long time later. I doubt that the people who were there right at the time realized all those implications. Apparently, God asked Abraham to, physic Abraham to physically do this process of cutting animals and laying them apart on the ground for a period of time. Abraham needed to protect the raw meat from vultures, etc. But then Abraham fell into a deep sleep that included a vision during which he saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, Genesis 15, 17, which suddenly appeared and passed between the pieces of the animals. So what was the flaming fire pot and the, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch? Is that a, are those symbols of God? He's frequently represented as fire. Yeah. Okay. God promised Abraham that his descendants would rule almost the entire Middle East. Later, God said, forever, Genesis 17, 8. What a promise. So when is that going to happen? When will the Jewish king rule the world forever? Well, some think it's going to be, uh, some think it started a, couple of uh, 1,000, 1,500 years ago, actually. Yeah. 2,000, I should say, 2,500 years ago. Yeah. 3,000. What is it? 3,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the, the king who will reign forever is? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Son of man and son of God. The boundaries of this promised land from the... I'm sorry, Gordon, that's yours. No, Myra, sorry. The boundaries of this promised land, the, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, referred to in Genesis 15, 18, remind us of the boundaries of the Garden of Eden. Compare with Genesis 2, 13 and 14. Now, what, what do we have regarding the Garden of Eden that was similar to this? From the river to the river. Yeah, well, remember those four rivers that came out of the garden? And one goes down into Africa, and that would be the southern part, and one goes up, one is the Euphrates, and that's Kerr over Mesopotamia. So there's a similarity anyway between what it's saying here and what they had back in Canaan, back in the Garden of Eden. This prophecy has, therefore, more in view than just ex the Exodus and in the homeland of Israel. On the distant horizon of this prophecy, in Abraham's descendants taking the country of Canaan looms the idea of the end-time salvation of God's people who will return to the Garden of Eden. It's an adult Sabbath school Bible study guide Sunday, May 8. Okay, does this promise from God really have any implications for us near the end of time? Well, we've already suggested that the Jewish king who's going to rule forever was? Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. Does that have something to do with us? It certainly does. Although God had promised Abraham that he would have descendants and that they would reap a great future benefit, Abraham still had doubts. I mean, who wouldn't? Where were those descendants? Or at least a start. As time passed and Abraham grew older and Sarah stopped having her monthly periods, she finally suggested that they should try a method often used under such circumstances in the territory from which they had come. Now, did they consult God about this? Probably if they not. had if they had the relationship though that we think they had, you know, with Abram leaving his homeland and going why now do they not consult God? Mm. You know? Well, you know, we gotta I mean, take steps on our on our own. You know, we have to do the best we can, is what they said. Yeah. And we say sometimes. We have to do. So, yeah. what did Abraham say to Sarah when she stopped having periods? It's over. Where's that son you're supposed to give me? Hmm? Okay, Gordon, Genesis 16. Verse 1 through 16 from the Good News Bible. Abram's wife Sarai, Sarai had not borne him any children, but she had an Egyptian slave woman named Hagar. And so she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Why don't you sleep with my slave? Perhaps she can have a child for me. Okay. Or is it for me or for you, Abram? Yeah. Abram agreed with what Sarai said. So she gave Hagar to him to be his concubine. This happened after Abram had lived in Canaan for 10 years. Now, Gordon, you're an expert on this, I'm sure. What's a concubine? <laughs> that's it. It, that's just, it, that's it, it. It's another word for mistress, but a. Um, the Latin word just means someone you sleep with. Yeah. You don't have to, you're not married to them, fully married to them. They just sleep with them. Okay? It's a mistress, but in the open. Yeah. Verse 4 Abram had intercourse with Hagar, and she became pregnant. When she found out that she was pregnant, she became proud and despised Sarai. Then Sarai said to Abram, It's your fault that Hagar despises me. I myself gave her to you, and ever since she found out that she was pregnant, she has despised me. May the Lord judge which of us is right, you or me. Mm -hmm. You, Abram, or me, Sarai. Yeah. Abram answered, Very well, she is your slave and under your control. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai treated Hagar so cruelly that she ran away. The angel of the Lord met Hagar at a spring in the desert on the road to Shur and said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She answered, I am running away from my mistress. Okay, now try to imagine you're running away from your mistress and suddenly you hear a voice out in the desert. Where did this voice come from? Or did someone, did God come down and appear like a human being and ask her? The angel of the Lord, Yahweh, met Hagar. What does that mean? Well, we know the rest of the story. So you kind of go, she must have there must have been something to give her an indication that this was not just somebody she met in the crossroads. Mm -hmm. it, it was an angel or God himself. Mm -hmm. So God speaks to more than just saints, huh? Mm -hmm. So, verse 9, he said, Go back to her and be her slave. Then he said, I will give you so many descendants that no one will be able to count them. You are going to have a son, and you will name him Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your cry of distress. But your son will live like a wild donkey. He will be against everyone, and everyone will be against him. He will live apart from all his relatives. Hagar said to herself, <clears throat> Have I really seen God and lived to tell about it? So she called the Lord who had spoken to her a son who sees, a, a God. God who sees. 
That is why people call the well between Kadesh and Bered the, the well of the living one who sees me. Hagar bore Abram a son, and he named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old at the time. Okay, so, so now that's this where you is, get the 14 years. This is, the, this is where we get our 14 years, more or less, between his, his age and the age of Isaac. When we look at the New Testament to see what comments are made about this arrangement, we read Genesis 4, 27 to 31, For the scripture says, Be happy, you childless woman. Shout and cry with joy, you who never felt the pains of childbirth. For the woman who was deserted will have more children than the wo woman whose husband never left her. Now you, my brothers and sisters, are God's children as a result of his promise, just as Isaac was. At that time, the son who was born in the usual way, persecuted. Now there's an idea about what was actually happening between Ishmael and Isaac. Persecuted the one who was born because of God's spirit. And it is the same now. But what does the scripture say? It says, send the slave woman and her son away, for the son of the slave woman will not have a part of the father's property along with the son of the free woman. So then, my brothers and sisters, we are not the children of a slave woman, but of a free woman. Good news Bible. Wow. As we read, in spite of God's promise, many years passed, and Abraham still did not have a son by Sarah. Finally, as above, Abraham and Sarah decided to try a human method. It's interesting to notice that Sarah's appeal to Abraham and the result should remind us of something that happened many years earlier. Jim? The passage describing Sarah's relationship, excuse me, relation to Abram, echoes the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The two texts share a number of common motifs. Sarai, like Eve, is active. Abraham, like Adam, is passive. And share common verbs and phrases. Heed the voice, take and give. This parallel between the two stories implies God's Appro disapproval of this course of action from the Bible study guide from Monday. Okay, May. so there's another interesting parallel. Uh, and remember that the language that Hebrew, was, I mean, that the Hebrew was written in, the early Hebrew was written in, a, that uh, Moses was writing in, it was a very primitive language. And the fact that he uses the same words to describe two different situations, does that make them similar, or does that just mean that's the only words he had for it? One of the problems I've learned about Hebrew, there, there's the word Asa, has as many as 75 different words in English from mm -hmm. that one Hebrew word. For example, uh, for in six days God made the heaven and the earth. But that word that is translated into English is made is the word Asa. It could be he did. He did. There's several other, you know, a way of so that's what you're trying to make a, a story with. Yeah, yeah. There's no evidence that either Abraham or Sarah or the two of them together had consulted with God regarding their plan. Paul saw a very interesting parallel between these two women and the two covenants. Who, which are the two covenants? The first covenant was when? That was the covenant at the foot of Mount Sinai, where the people said what? Everything you we'll say do. we're going to do. All that the Lord has said we will do, right? And how long did that last? <laughs> A few days, maybe. Yeah, it didn't work. They turned around and it was forgotten. Yeah. So... We could look again at Galatians 2, Galatians 4, 23 to 26. Um, Which we read just before. Yeah, we just read, so we don't read, need to read that again. Eventually things turned sour, and Sarah made things so difficult for Hagar, Genesis 16, 6, that Hagar took her son and fled into the desert. But God was not finished with this story. As we read in the Bible, Let's see, where are we? Thanks, Maita. God then appears to Hagar, but only after she has left the house of Abram. This unexpected appearance discloses God's presence in spite of human attempts to work without him. 
The reference to the angel of the Lord, Genesis 16:7, New King James Version, is a title that is often identified with the Lord. Yahweh, I guess that's mm, yes. Cool. That's the way it's written in Hebrew. Yeah. See Genesis 18:1, 13, and 22. This time it is God who takes the initiative and announces to Hagar that she will give birth to a son, Ishmael, whose name means God hears. That's Genesis sixteen eleven. Okay, I now I want you to notice this because we're gonna we're gonna see a parallel a little bit later. Ishmael name Ishmael's name means what? God hears. God hears. So keep that in mind. Okay, where did I get to? Ironically. Ironically, the story which ends with the idea of hearing Shama echoes the hearing at the beginning of the story when Abram heeded, in brackets, Shama, the voice of Sarai. Genesis uh, 16, 2, from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. From my in Genesis 17, when Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him. That was the three men walking in the heat of the day, and again promised him a son. In connection with this covenant, there were to be changes in names from Abram to Abraham and from Sarai to Sarah. The terms of which this covenant was described should remind us of Genesis 3.15, the first covenant of salvation given to Adam and Eve outside the Garden of Eden. So now we we really don't have time to go back and look at the parallels, but if you look at those two stories side by side, you would be able to see some parallels. In order for a covenant to be an everlasting covenant, we talked about that back at the beginning, Genesis 17, 7, and must involve the coming of Jesus and his eventual reign as a future Messiah. Notice in Genesis 3.15, Eve's descendants are, and Satan were always to be enemies. And God's free gift of salvation, Romans 6.23, was given before the beginning of time. So now we're starting to see how this everlasting part comes in. Titus 1.2. Twain? Titus 1.2, which is based on the hope for eternal life. God, who does not lie, promised us this life before the beginning of time. So how old is this promise? Very old. Very old, before the beginning of time. That reminds me of Micah 5, 2, where it talks about the birthplace of Jesus. This is going to be in Bethlehem, whose family line goes back <laughs> basically forever. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> go ahead. Do uh, you want to go ahead and read the next paragraph there? Interestingly, this promise of an eternal future is contained in the change of names of Abram and Sarai. The names of Abram and Sarai referred to re referred just to their present status. Abraham, I'm sorry, Abram means exalted father, and Sarai means my princess, the princess of Abram. The change of their names into Abraham and Sarah referred to the future. Abraham means father of many nations. And Sarah means the princess for everyone. In parallel, but not without some irony, the name of Isaac, he will laugh, is a reminder of Abraham's, laugh, Abraham's laughter, the first laughter recorded in the scriptures. Okay, now, we heard Ishmael's name means what? He hears. And now Isaac's name means wow. he laughs. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Uh, it is a laughter of skepticism, or maybe of wonder. Either way, though he believed in what the Lord had clearly promised him, Abraham still struggled with living it out in faith and trust. Okay, for Tuesday, the Bible study guide from Tuesday, May 10. Uh, Myra? It is in this context that Abram, whose name implies nobility and respectability, will have his name changed to Abraham, which means father of many nations, Genesis 17:5. Thus we see here more hints of the universal nature of what God plans to do through his covenant with Abraham. 
Do you think any of these ancient peoples had any idea that they were going to have a descendant who would eventually rule the world? <coughs> no. Probably not, huh? No. Not likely. Do we ever have times when it seems to God's promises are delayed? That couldn't happen to us, right? How many times since 1844 have Adventists or some Adventists tried to say the second coming was going to happen? Yeah. We know specifically of 1854, 1864, 1884, 1883 actually before that, 1890 somewhere, somewhere in the 1900s. These are groups of people that tried to set those dates, tried to set, they had claimed that they knew that God's promises, Jesus would come at that time. So, just... Well, there have been sermons preached just about every week by someone that say, God is coming soon. Yep. Well, associated with this covenant and those name changes, there was to be a sign. That sign was circumcision. Then, finally, God promised that Sarah herself would have a child. Genesis 18. And how many trained soldiers did Abraham have? 317. 318 trained soldiers besides at least that many shepherds. And who was supposed to be circumcised? All of them. Every man in his household. Try to imagine that process. Scholars have wondered how many, many times about the purpose of circumcision. In Canaan, Abraham was living in the midst of many fertility cult religions. It was accepted in those societies for young men to go out and have sexual intercourse with temple prostitutes as a part of their religious services. That seems a little you know, unbelievable to us, but that was the way it was. The idea was that you, you know, if you could do something with sexual nature, you will improve their the fertility of crops, or the animals, and so forth. One explanation for circumcision is that it would be impossible for a young Hebrew, male, to get involved in those fertility cult practices without it being obvious that he was circumcised, thereby identifying himself as a Hebrew. Now that's just one of the possible explanations, but I think that's, that's maybe, one of, maybe the only one I know of that's really sort of plausible to me. This covenant involving circumcision was to include not just Abraham and the future son of Sarah, but also all those who belonged to Abraham. That must have been a lot of males. Okay, so Genesis 17, 23 to 27. Four times in those verses, the word all is used to emphasize that all males from Abraham's household were included. Four times, all, 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 okay? And... Looking again at Genesis 17, 19, still in that same area in Genesis 17, we notice that this child to whom Sarah was to give birth would be part of an everlasting covenant. Once again, we're, we're seeing these ties and these links. Much later, Moses had an interesting experience regarding circumcision. Remember that Abraham had lived among the Midianite people for 40 years, herding sheep and associating with them. His Midianite wife, Zipporah, had given it's him... actually Moses had lived 40 years, isn't it? Did I see? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Moses had lived among the Midianite people for 40 years. Thank you, Gordon. Herding sheep and associating with them. His Midianite wife, Zipporah, had given him two sons. The older son had been circumcised at his birth, and they were following Hebrew custom. But apparently, and you know, years went by, apparently when the second son was born, Moses probably thought, well, we don't really need to go through that kind of bloody process. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'll ever be associated with the Hebrews again. So he wasn't circumcised. Moses had failed to circumcise him. So on the way to Egypt to lead the Israelites out of slavery. Exodus 4, 25 and 26. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, and touched Moses' feet with it. Because, a right of because of the right of circumcision, she said to Moses, You are a husband of blood to me. And so the Lord spared Moses' life. So leading up to that, the angel stood in the way and 
appeared that he was going to kill Moses. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hear and touched Moses' feet. That's a very uh, nice uh, modern adaptation. It's actually Moses' testicles that were touched here because that was the, you know, generating organ. On the way from, Mi I'm sorry, go ahead, Gordon. From Patriarchs and Prophets. On the way from Midian, Moses received a startling and terrible warning of the Lord's displeasure. An angel appeared to him in a threatening manner as if he would immediately destroy him. No explanation was given, but Moses remembered that he had disregarded one of God's requirements. Yielding to the persuasion of his wife, he had neglected to perform the rite of circumcision upon their youngest son. Okay, now let's back up for a second. Where did the Midianites come from? They were descendants of Lot's... Well, Lot, they, were, they were Zipporah. They were, they were one of the six sons of Keturah. Right. These were Abraham's right. descendants. And they all should have been... Circumcised. Circumcised. Okay. Yeah, didn't, didn't want to do that. He had failed to comply with the condition by which his child could be entitled to the blessings of God's covenant with Israel. And such a neglect on the part of their chosen leader could not, be le could not but lessen the force of the divine precepts upon the people. Zipporah, fearing that her husband would be slain, performed the rite herself. And the angel then permitted Moses to pursue his journey. So if she's the one who con convinced her husband not to do it, she says, I better change my mind now. I better do this. In his mission to Pharaoh, that is in Moses' mission to Pharaoh, Moses was to be placed in a position of great peril. His life could be preserved only through the protection of holy angels. But while living in neglect of a known duty, he would not be secure, for he could not be shielded by the angels of God. Ellen White, Ain oh, Patriarch Patriarch and Prophets, Prophets, 255. Okay, so here's a question that we would, if we went all the way through the Old Testament, we would see statements like this a number of different places. And basically it says, it, it, the idea is if somebody does something wrong and therefore God cannot do thus and so for them. Why not? Because somebody else is requesting. Somebody else has something to say about that? Satan is referring to the devil himself. Said, "This person is mine. You don't have the right to do that. He's following me, and you can't do that." As a future, and of course, we don't understand that background. This doesn't make any sense at all. As a future leader of the people of Israel, Moses needed to be a faithful example by following exactly the direction that God had given to Israel. Those of us who live after New Testament times realize how controversial the issue of circumcision became, and you remember going back to Acts 15, etc. Only later, as described in Genesis 18, did the experience happen with the three strangers who approached Abraham. Seeing those three strangers walking toward him at a distance, he rushed out to invite them to his house for a meal. Abraham became an example of great hospitality and the conversation a son was promised to Abraham. And now we go back and pick up the story and see the, just the key verses here. Genesis 18, 1, 13, and 22. The Lord appeared to Abraham. Now we see Yahweh appeared to Abraham as a, at the sacred trees of memory as Abraham was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the hottest part of the day. Then Yahweh... God's personal name, asked Abram, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I'm so old? We've already read that verse. Then, verse 22, then the two men left and went on towards Sodom. But the Lord, Yahweh, remained with Abraham. Good news Bible. Several things happened during this, time, this visit by Christ and two angels that are noteworthy. Partly as a result of what happened at that visit, Abraham became a great example of faith. Would you find it easy to trust in God's promise even after years had passed with no results? So that would suggest that despite the 25 years that have gone by, when God said, you are going to have a child, Abraham believed it. Not just a child, but the child. so many 
that they're going to be more than the stars yeah. in the sky. Yeah. Looking at that time when the three strangers appear, approached Abraham in the desert and were welcomed into his home, we notice it is not clear whether Abraham knew who these three strangers were. Hebrews 13, 2. Even though he acted toward them as if God himself were among them. He was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, Genesis 18, 1. And because visitors are rare in the desert, he was probably longing to meet with them. He wanted to know what's going on. You know, where have you been? What, what's, you know, tell me. Uh, Abraham ran toward the man, 18, 2, although he was 99 years old. Wonder how well he did running at that age. He called one of these persons Adonai, which is a Hebrew word for my Lord, a title often used for God, Genesis 20, verse 4, and Exodus 15, verse 17. He rushed around them in the preparation of the meal, Genesis 18, 16, 6 and 7. He stood next to them, attentive to their needs and ready to serve them, Genesis 18, 8, and that's our Bible study guide coming to some conclusions there. In this story, God's comments, compare Matthew 25, 35 to 40, suggest that welcoming strangers into our homes is not just a nice courtesy, but also a religious duty. Could it be that God identifies himself more closely with the hungry and the needy than with the generous ones who receive them? Could that be? Moving on with our story, because we're running out of time, Abraham walked with Christ towards Sodom. And I'm just going to drop down here a little bit. As you know, they begin to talk back and forth, and God says, I've heard there's a lot of problems down there in Sodom. I'm going to go and kill all those people. I'm going to get rid of them. Genesis 15, 16. The Lord said, it will be four generations before your descendants come back. I'm sorry. Um, they must be punished. Uh, and now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Jim, that'll be yours. I'm sorry. The Lord said, I will be... Excuse me, it will be four, four generations before your descendants come back here because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked that they must be punished. Good News Bible. Weren't they wicked enough in the days of Lot and Abraham is the question. <laughs> okay. And now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Already the clouds of vengeance cast their shadows over the devoted city. But men perceived it not. While angels drew near on their mission of destruction, men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was like every other day, like every other that had come and gone. Evening fell upon the scene of loveliness and security. A landscape of unrivaled beauty was bathed in the rays of declining sun. The coolness of eventide had called forth the inhabitants of the city, and the pleasure-seeking throngs were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 157-158. So let's go to the ball game. Let's just relax and enjoy ourselves. It's just an ordinary day, right? The details of the story are so outlandish that it is hard for us to believe that it could really have happened like that. Carrie? Reading from Genesis chapter 19, verses 14 and 15, Then Lot went to the men that his daughters were going to marry and said, Hurry up and get out of here. The Lord is going to destroy this place. But they thought he was joking. At dawn the angels tried to make Lot hurry. Quick, they said, take your wife and your two daughters and get out so that you will not lose your lives when the city is destroyed. It's from the Good News Bible. The word hafak, overthrew, used in this text to describe the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, suggests a reversal, just as the flood reversed creation. The destruction of Sodom is a reversal of the Garden of Eden. Might it also be a precursor to what will happen at the end of time? We know that only Lot and his two daughters uh, were, were saved. So why did they end up in living in a cave? Why didn't, and this, this one just completely blows my mind, why didn't they go to Uncle Abraham's place? What happened to their flocks and herds? I mean, they, these herds, flocks and herds were so large they couldn't, they couldn't stay with Abraham. And were, they got, were the flocks and herds all consumed by the, the fire or whatever? Is it appropriate for us to pray for the wicked? Shouldn't we follow the example of Abraham? 
Elsewhere in the Bible, we read on several occasions that sinners are the ones who will reap the consequences of their sins, not their fathers, not their children. Okay? But in this story, God promised Abraham that he would preserve the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if there were even 10 people in those cities who were righteous. Notice these comments from the Bible study guide. Dwayne? In an extremely revolutionary manner, the old collective thinking which brought the guiltless member of the guilty association under punishment has been transposed into something new. The presence of a remnant of righteous people could have a preserving function for the whole. For the sake of the righteous remnant, Yahweh would in his righteousness forgive the wicked city. This notion is widely expanded in the prophetic utterance of the servant of Yahweh, who works salvation for many. Okay, so sometimes we sort of suggest, and it's suggested in several places in the Bible, that maybe if there's one rotten apple in the, babe, in the, in the barrel, you know, you throw out the whole barrel. But in this time, God seemed to suggest, now we know it didn't happen that way, but if there had been even 10 people in these two cities, all the whole cities, both Sodom and Gomorrah, would have been preserved because of the 10 people. So it's the good apple takes care of all the rotten ones. That's backwards, right? Is it true that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Will he destroy the wicked in the end, or is God too loving to do that? How do we explain verses like Amos 4.11? Myra? I destroyed some of you as I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Those of you who survived were like the, a burning stick saved from the fire. Still, you did not come back to me, says the Lord. In the Bible, we see that Abraham's faith has counted him as righteousness, and he is repeatedly called the great example of faith. Would you still describe Abraham as a great man of faith, considering what we have studied? Think of the questions and doubts and his unwillingness to wait for the son to be born. He even laughed at God, but he tried to plead for Sodom and Gomorrah. Think how graciously he cared for those three visitors. And what, what, what was it Abraham feared? What do many of us fear? And I'm going to have to jump down here because we're running out of time. Um, Abraham had a firm trust in God. He, counted, he was accounted as righteous because he trusted God's promises. Um, after Abraham laughed at God, later Sarah laughed at God, we, feel, we find that God had the last laugh because Isaac's name was means he laughs, and the subject implied is God. Does the study of Abraham and Sarah help your faith increase or decrease? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we have studied these incredible stories of your champions of faith so long ago, we realize that we have things to learn, that there are ser serious messages here. God chose these people not because they were perfect, but because they were like us. And they were the kind of people that he could work with, the people who would make mistakes but always came back to him and promised to follow him. May we be the same as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.